very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a wonderful conference. And uh, uh, I can't help remembering that you know we started talking about the quantum second quantum revolution 20 years ago. It was a meeting in Helsinki in 98. And everybody was saying, yeah, the second quantum revolution is coming. Let's get more money. And so the, this conference is essentially just a proof that if many people speak in unison and ask for more money and young people are coming, they are here. So uh, I don't know whether quantum technologies will be relevant. They probably will. But in my opinion, the most important thing is to take the kids off the streets and this is what we're doing here. We're kind of igniting the imagination of young people and old ones as well. So um, that's the title. And uh, you notice here also the gravitational waves, which seem to be the motto of today's first session. So the Heisenberg uncertainty in the um, dimensionless units, if you want to measure a position, of an oscillating mirror, for example, an oscillating object, then this position in the lab frame is written through the non-commuting variables x and p. And if you are trying to measure this position in the lab frame, for instance, by reflecting light from it, then in phase space, you first measure x, but you put the back action in p. And then quarter period later, you measure p. And you keep going and keep going. And the more you measure, the more you disturb. And this is this balance between the measurement precision and disturbance. And this is why you have the stem quantum limits of measurement. So what I want to tell you today about is that, indeed, yet both position and momentum can be measured within principal arbitrary accuracy if you choose the right reference frame. So it's been also a talk about reference frames in, the, in Philip's talk. So I'll continue, but it will be a very different story of the reference frames. So we call this business trajectories without quantum uncertainties. And uh, Carl Caves also coined the term quantum mechanics free subspaces. And you can read more about it in those papers. So classical trajectory, quantum trajectory, wave packets, and so on. So we want our quantum trajectory to look like classical trajectory so that we can follow an object with unlimited accuracy. And we need three steps for that. So first of all, you need to define the motion relative to some special reference frame, which will be a quantum reference frame. And this reference system should have an effective negative mass. And I'll tell you about it real soon. And you'll see that it's not science fiction. And finally, you need to create a quantum entangled state of the reference frame and the probe system. And then you have your cake and you eat it. So let's see how it might work. Here is my function of interest, x with respect to the reference frame x0. And also, there is a momentum. And we all know that there could be the EPR state, einstein polovsky rosen entangled state, where this difference and this sum can go to 0 in their uncertainty because they are commuting operators. So let's see how it works. If I take now in the laboratory reference frame, the position of my object as a function of time with respect to the reference frame, then this is trivial, right? It's the initial position difference plus the difference between the derivatives times time, kinematics. If now I take the derivatives and supplement them with the momenta, then unfortunately, I have a minus here. And this is also the difference. So I don't get commuting variables in my expression, I get non-commuting variables. And therefore, I cannot do the trick. So it's not good enough. But now, if I can change this minus sign to the plus sign here, which means that the derivative of the position operator of my reference system is minus its momentum, then everything is fine. And how should it be? Well. You introduce an effective negative mass. 
and for an effective negative mass, this derivative has a minus sign here. And now you have commuting variables defining your trajectory, and then you can keep measuring, and you will see arbitrary small disturbances in both x and p. And the same story goes for an oscillator. And for an oscillator, you can also think about it not as a negative mass, but a negative frequency. Because you have a sign here, and if the frequency of my reference frame is effectively negative, then this minus will be changed into a plus, and again, life is good. So let me introduce a oscillator with the negative effective mass. And the signature of it is essentially that the first excited state of this oscillator has an energy which is below the ground state. Well, here is the Bloch sphere. Let's say I have a lot of atoms, an atomic ensemble, spin one halves for, for a change, and I orient them all in one direction. So I can write down this commutator. One component is large and classical, so I remove a hat. And then if I divide both sides by Jz, then I will actually get a commutation relation for an oscillator. So a spin-oriented ensemble of atoms can be seen as an oscillator, in particular if you put it in the magnetic field, which will provide the splitting between spin up and spin down. So this initial state is all spins up. And if I zoom into the North Pole, I will get this kind of the trivial picture for the ground state of an oscillator. And if I create a single excitation of the oscillator, meaning that I flip one spin, but I don't know which one. It's a collective excitation. Then what I get is the first excited state. And clearly, because of the curvature of this sphere, the first excited state is a little closer to the South Pole, which means, obviously, that the energy of the first excited state is below the ground state. And here is the negative mass oscillator or the oscillator with the effective negative frequency. And you get the oscillator by simply putting everything in the magnetic field. So it begins to oscillate at the larval frequency. And uh, in this work uh, from last year, we actually demonstrated that the principle works. So here is our mechanical oscillator. It oscillates. Let's assume that we initiate it in the ground state. And it's a normal oscillator. The high is the excitation. The high is the energy. And this is our magnetic oscillator. And if we orient it in a specific way, namely along the magnetic field, then the first excited state will have the energy below the ground state. And that will be the negative mass or negative frequency oscillator. And so the idea is essentially that you make a joint measurement on those two oscillators. And because it's a joint measurement, the effect of the quantum back action on those two systems can be canceled out, and you can create an entangled state. So uh, that's the zoom into the experimental setup, as seen by an artist. So here we have our little atomic sample. I don't have time to go into details, but it's essentially a gas of atoms contained in this little channel. And the channel is rather special. It's coated with some alkane coating from inside so that spins can bounce off this coating 10,000 times without losing their quantum state. So it's a wonderful room temperature uh, quantum system of uh, 10 to the eight or more atoms. And uh, the mechanical system is also rather unique. It's uh, a membrane, which is rather macroscopic. It's half by half millimeter here. This thing is more like a centimeter size. And this little membrane is suspended in the so-called phononic band gap structure. And we do this to obtain a really record-breaking 
mechanical Q factors which are necessary to keep the quantum state of the mechanical oscillator intact during the measurement. So this is the kind of the picture of the atomic part. Inside this uh, magnetic shield we have the atomic system and there is some measurement stuff. So half of you who are experimentalists probably recognize the bits and pieces. And let me just quickly present uh, what we are measuring. So here is our atomic system. And the spin is oriented like that. In the classical sense, we put it in the magnetic field. And we send linearly polarized light through this system. And linearly polarized light sent through the oscillating spin will produce a signal due to the Faraday rotation. And looking at the signal, we can tell about the spin projection on this plane. So it's all fine. And you will be, in principle, measuring the x component, which is the projection on the z in the rotating frame and then the y, those two axes. But of course, if you are measuring this spin continuously, then as I told you in the first slide, you impose the back action. You measure this projection, and then you put the back action on this projection. And since this thing continuously rotates, then you are just piling up the, the back action of the measurement. And here is the back action noise in both of those channels. And this is the experimental result. So uh, if we measure this, uh, if we run this experiment, then essentially, by some careful calibration, we can say, OK, this is the noise spectrum at the Larmor frequency of 1.3 megahertz in this case. And this noise spectrum contains the quantum back action of the measurement and the intrinsic noise of the spin, which is nearly ground state of the spin. So the important part here is that we can indeed observe the quantum back action imposed by light on this oscillator. So that's a good starting point. The next thing is the mechanical object. So we have this membrane oscillating and placed in, inside the optical resonator. And uh, this will be a one minute crash course in quantum optomechanics. But essentially, this uh, resonator has a resonant mode. And depending on what the frequency of the input light is, the oscillation of this mechanical membrane will place sidebands on the input light. So there will be a red sideband detuned from the laser by the mechanical frequency and the blue sideband. And depending on where you are detuned, to the higher frequency or lower frequency, it will be either the red sideband or the blue sideband that will be created with pleasure. So in this picture, it's the red sideband created. So you create a photon which has the frequency below the laser frequency. This energy should go somewhere, and it goes into the birth of a phonon an extra quantum of excitation. So the Hamiltonian is a very familiar thing, a parametric Hamiltonian. Many of you know it. If I now go on the other side of the resonance, then I am creating a blue phonon, photon, sorry, which means that I have to take away the, the energy from the mechanical oscillation. And this means that I am annihilating a phonon, which means that it's a beam splitter interaction. and then you can actually place your laser right in the middle, and then you get a quantum non-demolition interaction. So it's a very nice and pretty system, in some sense, simple. Um, I would like to highlight again that uh, we have fantastic membranes here. And uh, my student, Yegishet Sadoran, has been behind the development of those wonderful membranes. And uh, in this experiment, which is run at 6 Kelvin, relatively modest cryogenic temperature. Uh, we use the membrane with 20 million Q, but we now have much better membranes. 
So the same thing of observing the quantum back action for the mechanical system. We have this membrane sitting in a nice enclosure. We shine light on it, and uh, we observe the signals. And our signal, which is, for example, that one, we can calibrate it, and we can figure out that the red part of this noise spectrum, which is now centered at the drum mode frequency of this membrane, which is, again, 1.3 megahertz. The red part is the quantum back action of the measurement. So the photons of light bombard this membrane and lead to the quantum back action of the measurement, which disturbs the position of the membrane. And the yellow part is almost the ground state uh, noise of the membrane. So again, the important thing is that we can observe the quantum back action of the measurement for the membrane as well. And now we put those two things together, and we want to show that the quantum back action can actually be reduced. And uh, this is what we see. So the result of this experiment is presented here. So what you see is the membrane only first. This is the total noise centered again at the membrane drum frequency. And out of this total noise, the shaded area is the quantum back action. And now I turn on my spin as the negative mass device. And now the red area is the new quantum back action. And I hope you are convinced that the red area is significantly smaller than the shaded area. So we're adding a new system, the atoms. They have their own noise. They have their own quantum back action. And yet, the quantum back actions interfere destructively because of this principle of the negative mass. And you observe the reduction. Well, it's not stellar. It's only 30%. But that was the first try. And uh, it's, as always in this business, it's about reducing losses. So we're working on reducing losses. Those are the heroes in the lab. So you've seen this before. This is the gravitational wave. Well, it's not the signal that they saw. I happen to work at the institute where some people doubt that they actually observed gravitational waves. But let's not talk about it. Um, they were given the prize, which means that they did observe it, right? So no, kidding aside, they did observe gravitational waves. That's uh, obvious. But it's an amazingly difficult experiment. So you look at you know, the time when the LIGA first ran from 2015 to 2013, uh, 17, I'm sorry. So they observed five black hole merger events and one neutron star event. In the advanced LIGA design, which hopefully will be launched next year, they hope to improve the sensitivity by a factor of 2 to 3. And that would improve the number of events significantly. And still, it's not enough, because it's never enough. And you need to, to have better and better sensitivity. And every factor of 2 in sensitivity increases the volume of the universe by a factor of 8. So that's a wonderful, really wonderful gain. So this is the LIGA interferometer. It's a complicated machine. And uh, what we want to do is to apply the stuff that we have observed in the lab, that we have proposed and observed in the lab, that if you measure the position of an object in the reference frame of the atomic spin oscillator, then you can go beyond the quantum limits of sensitivity because you can reduce the quantum back action of the measurement. So again, how does it work for the end mirrors of the gravitational wave detector? Well, it's a free mass. It's actually a 40 kilogram thing suspended, as we heard this morning, with the frequency of below a hertz with the amazing Q factor. And uh, the position of this free mass is, of course, given by the initial position times momentum times T over M. 
those two values obey the uncertainty principle. And from here, you can actually easily see that this sum defines you how well you can observe the position of those mirrors. And if you plug in the numbers here and use this standard quantum limit, which comes from the maximizing this equation, you get this h bar t over m. And if you plug in the numbers, you will get something like that. So this is actually the LIGA large interferometer for gravitational wave observation noise budget. And it's plotted here from 10 hertz to a few kilohertz. Uh, so in the previous talk, the, con the emphasis was on the low frequency. And here it's what they are looking at at the moment with LIGA. And the important thing is that this purple curve is the quantum noise limit. So if you measure relatively quickly, that is to say you're interested in higher frequencies, then the short noise of light, which sets the phase uncertainty, is your limit. If, on the other hand, you measure longer corresponding to lower frequencies, then it's the radiation pressure, the back action noise of light, which sets the limit. But you want to measure everywhere, right? So you somehow need to reduce, at the same time, the radiation pressure noise and the phase noise. And this is what we think we can achieve, because we can do the broadband cancellation of the quantum noise. Right, so uh, there is also a big European plan to, to build something underground which will be even better than LIGA, somewhere kind of in the middle between, I think, Belgium, France, and something else. Um, and uh, this is what we propose to do. So the gravitational wave interferometer with end mirrors which are distorted by the gravitational wave. And uh, we want to put in something relatively small. It's not even to scale in this picture, because this is four kilometers, and this is going to be a two meter breadboard. So the heart of this breadboard will be an atomic sample, which will be kind of nicely packed and probed and uh, used in the same fashion as we demonstrated in this paper from a year ago that I just discussed. And the idea basically is that this is the, uh, the susceptibility of an oscillator, an oscillator frequency, higher frequency and 1 over omega square lower frequency and and the atoms are supposed to provide the same susceptibility, but inverted because it's a negative mass device. And now, if you look at the measurement result, which you get as a difference between looking at the readout of the gravitational wave detector and the readout of the atomic spin, it's the same thing as I've shown you in the first two slides, but for the free mass. So now the difference will be the difference between the coordinates, the difference between the momenta times t over m. And if here is a minus, then here you have a plus, And then you have commuting variables which define this measurement result, which means that you can measure it with arbitrary accuracy. Ta-da. Um, there is a paper a month old, two months old, where we actually present the idea. And uh, there are a few things that have to be done to make it happen. There are simple things, which is science, and there are difficult things, that is, to convince the gravitational wave community that it works. The important scientific business is that in the paper that I described in the first part of the talk, there was the beam of light 
which will go through both systems with the same quantum fluctuations mapped on the atoms and on the mechanical object. And then, because it's the same quantum state of light, then the back action is the same. And if the sign of the back action is negative for the atoms, then it can cancel out. Unfortunately, the gravitational wave community does not agree with cesium atoms in terms of the wavelength. Cesium atoms are non-negotiable in terms of the wavelength, and the LIGA community is also non-negotiable. So we cannot address those two systems with the same wavelength. But we want still entanglement and correlated quantum back action, which means that we simply need to use the einstein podolsky rosen entangled light at those two frequencies. And uh, I'm very happy that when I was a kid, I did actually an experiment of this kind. And we know how to create such entanglement. And we're going to use it in this experiment. And uh, roughly speaking, that's how it works. You measure on the gravitational wave detection. You measure the certain quadrature of light. This will be short noise of light, plus what you want to measure, plus the back action with the susceptibility and the effective readout rate. And you measure on the atoms as well. Similar thing, in which case the force terms will be simply thermal noise or quantum noise of the spins. You make sure that those two and those two are entangled. You make sure that the susceptibilities have the opposite sign. And then you simply have that there is a sum of the p's and the difference of x's. And they both can be squeezed in the EPR state, as we know. And therefore, you can have the noise which is eliminated in both shot noise and radiation pressure. And that's the results of the well, I would say as far as atoms are concerned, the simulations are realistic. Uh, on the interferometer side, they still need to work very hard to reduce the losses, but that's their problem. So this is where LIGA wants to be. This is the quantum noise. Again, the shot noise here, radiation pressure here. And this is what we promise to deliver something like a factor of two in the sensitivity across the entire band of measurement. And uh, we're building this system and this system in the lab. Thank you. And uh, the gravitational wave detection in the laboratory experiment will be modeled by some fancy phase rotator. And uh, if we can demonstrate that this works, then we will go out to the world and uh, try to convince the gravitational wave people. Thank you for your attention. So perhaps I have one, first one question. Um, in the gravitational wave uh, setup, uh, you don't need to put a negative uh, oscillator in each arm of the cav in no. each cavities because no. you have to control the phase or to control the phase of something uh, in order to well, have. Well, uh, the way it will be done is that the there will be that there is a free port of the gravitational wave yes. detector, yes. which is filled with vacuum at the moment, ah. and we will fill it okay. with our entangled light, and then the atomic system will be probed by another entangled light, part of the entangled light. And then simply the two detectors outputs will be subtracted. OK. Simply. Uh, yes, also about the gravitational wave detection. So now I think on LIGO they are using squeezed light. Uh, right. Uh, so is it uh, it's like very a step different. beyond this light? It's very different. So what squeezed light buys you is the power. Because if you use squeezed light and you look at this curve, then either you can get the same curve with reduced laser power, 
or if you use the same laser power, then you can move this curve in this direction. Because the squeezed light reduces either the shot noise, phase noise, or the back action noise, not both. There is also a proposal to use the squeezed light with the rotated phase so that you have the reduction of the phase noise at those frequencies and the reduction of the amplitude noise in those frequencies. But the frequencies are such that to achieve that, they need 300 meter long cavities. For you, it's not a problem, I understand, but some people think it is. Um, so we are trying to do something which does not involve touching the gravitational wave interferometer at all. Um, so two, two questions. You said that uh, so you are using cesium atoms, and you mentioned the problem of low wavelengths. Um, so finding an atom with 1064 is not easy, but could you use another atom where maybe it could work differently? And that, that was the first question. And the second one is you said they have to work a lot on the loss uh, in the interferometer. So could you say a little bit, please, on that? Right. So with respect to the wavelength, I think there is iodine at 1064. People can correct me. But trust me, to find an atom which you can make in a cloud of you know, 10 to the 12 with coherence time of a second and nice spin state. Mm -mm. Ethereum is a good candidate. Strontium is a good candidate, but the wavelengths are even further. And the other question was about losses. So as far as the laboratory experiment is concerned, which is also not, not a trashy thing. I mean, never mind the gravitational wave. We can demonstrate that force and acceleration can be detected beyond the standard quantum limit. So there, of course, we are working on the losses, and we believe that it will be better than 95% all the way through. With the gravitational wave detection, there are losses. There is phase matching of the beams, which are that big. and. Uh, I think they are doing their homework because they want to use squeezed light, right? So they need to reduce their losses. So by the time we are ready, we hope that they will be having low losses. <laughs> There's a question here. Uh, yes, I, I'm also um, very intrigued by this, uh, this part on, uh, on trying to use this trick to, to reduce the back action and on gravitational wave interferometer. So if, if I understand correctly, uh, if you want this constellation to work on all the frequency range, you need to tune the frequency, the Larmor frequency of the atoms to typically one hertz, to, to the same as the suspension. And how realistic is this? Is this is a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, Indeed. <laughs> it was my big headache because, in fact, as you point out, you need to match the susceptibilities. Well, the, the, the mirror is at 0.5 hertz. Never mind, we can probably put the Larmor frequency at 3 hertz, which is kind of OK, but it comes with technical complications. So we are actually writing a paper as we speak showing that, in fact, you can have the atomic Larmor frequency smack at around 100 hertz. And you massage the phases, and you get the same result or even better. So we are aware of the problem, and we think that we can address it by adjusting the phases of light in the right way and putting the Larmor frequency at 100 hertz. And we have experiments in the lab on completely different subjects on biomedical sensing beyond quantum limits, where we actually see quantum noise at a few hundred hertz. So we're, we're better off now as we were two months ago. Thank you. I think we have to stop. Let's thank Jean-Paul Zick again.